Welcome back, statistics students. This is the second lecture for week six for basic business statistics. And this week, we're going to learn about outliers. If we're standing at the mean of our distribution, then an outlier score is going to be far out in the tail of the distribution. We have to look really far in the distance to see that score. That's what makes it an outlier. It lies out a long distance away from most of the rest of the scores. So we need to know what are outliers and what should we do about them when we find them in our data set. To detect outliers, we should know first that an outlier is either an unusually high or an unusually low score in our distribution. Using our example with z-scores from the last video, we can calculate z-scores and any z-score that is greater than positive 3 or less than negative 3 would be considered an outlier. These are the extreme scores. Well, what causes these extreme scores? It's important to remember that sometimes, just through natural random selection, we will get extreme scores in our data set. We could have randomly selected someone who is unusually tall, and that might create an outlier with our height data. Or we could randomly select someone who is unusually heavy, or smart, or rich. And all of these examples could skew our measures. Someone who is older than everyone else in the data set. Or we pick a, uh, a product that is particularly expensive. Maybe there's a spike in gas prices. All of these could create outliers, but they are legitimate scores. We can get these outliers through random selection. However, when we have a larger data set, the larger number of scores is to help, will help balance out those outliers. This is one reason why it's good to have as many people or participants or observations in your data set as you possibly can. So our first cause for outliers could be a legitimate score. Nothing we've done wrong. On the other hand, we could have a data entry error, where the data were simply entered into the data set incorrectly. The score was supposed to be a 6. It was recorded as a 66. This creates an outlier. Perhaps there was some sort of malfunction with a sensor that was measuring something like reaction time. Something went wrong with the sensor, it gives us an unusually high or low score. Another cause for outliers might be sampling error. We include someone in our sample who is really not part of the population that we intend to study. We're looking at a collection of scores from a classroom. And as we examine the age values, we find one individual who is unusually old compared to the average age of all of the other individuals in our sample. Well, what happened was we included the professor in the study. And the professor is not really part of the population of college students that we're trying to study. So we would probably remove that outlier. Or we're studying bilingual students, and we have one person with a very low score. But as we examine what is happening, we find this is someone who got put into this class, but yet hasn't really learned English yet, and so is performing at a very low level. Well, that's not really who we are intending to study. So we could remove that score from our distribution. So there's one more cause for outliers that you typically don't see described this way, but outliers can be caused by jerks. What I mean is you have someone taking your survey who's not taking it seriously, answering one on every item, or not answering, creating a heart-shaped pattern on the, the Scantron form rather than answering seriously. Or you get bots answering your online survey, something that is not a real person but has been coded to answer surveys, and that could mess with your distribution as well. It's okay to remove outliers that are caused by jerks. At least I think so. What problems can be caused by outliers? In this example, you'll see a column of x values that have an outlier of 20. In the x1 column, I have Windsorized that 20. I have moved it down to the next reasonable number, which is a 9. 
I've calculated the mean and the standard deviation and a correlation using x and x1, and let's see what could happen. The first problem caused by outliers is that we'll extend the mean in the direction of the outlier. In this case, you can see the outlier mean is a 6.44. When we remove the outlier or Windsorize the outlier, it, the mean drops down to a 5.2. Second, the outlier will broaden the standard deviation. You can see that the standard deviation with the outlier is like twice as much as the Windsorized version. Both of these errors will bias our population parameter estimates. If we try to use the mean and standard deviation to estimate population parameters, those estimates will be biased or wrong. Outliers will distort normality. That means that when we plot these scores, we will see the outliers in the histogram. They will attenuate correlations. Now, this is true when we have bivariate outliers. In this case, I I correlated X and X1 with a Y score, and you'll see that the correlations are both 0.64, but if we had an outlier in the Y, we would see that distortion occurring. And then finally, and this is another one that doesn't get talked about very much, outliers can compromise confidentiality. You may inadvertently identify certain individuals in your study. One example would be the example that I used with the students and the professor whose age we were able to determine this score came from the professor. Same thing could occur in other data sets where one outlier identifies one particular individual in your study, and that compromises your confidentiality and something we should be aware of, especially if you're making your raw data available to other researchers. So let's return to Excel. And this time we're going to use the Outliers tab to take our z-scores, sort them, and identify outliers in this data set. For simplicity, I've removed other variables. We just have the dog number, which is the random identifier, the raw scores, and the z-scores. So select the column C for dog toys owned, the z-scores, and then we'll use the sort function to sort from largest to smallest. We'll get a sort warning, which says there are other data points that also need to be sorted along with these, and so we want to expand the selection, and then click Sort. This will move our greatest or our largest z-score to the top, which we can see is a z-score of 3.712. That z-score is exceptionally large. That is an outlier. And we see that it's the dog that owns 20 toys. So that is our outlier score. We then can make some decisions about what we should do with this score. The first thing that we might note is that is probably a legitimate score. This dog just happens to own an exceptional amount of toys. Now, it doesn't mean that this, this outlier couldn't still bias our results, so we need to make some decisions about what we will do about this outlier. What are the options for outliers? In this example with the 20 toys, this is a legitimate outlier. So we should first start by asking, is this outlier part of the population? In the example with the students and the professor, the professor wasn't part of the population, we might remove that outlier just by taking it out of the data set. In this case, this person or this dog is a legitimate part of this study, so we should then ask, is this causing a problem? Well, if it's not badly distorting any other part of our analysis, then it would be okay to leave it in. But if it is causing a problem, then we're going to need to do something about that outlier. We could use a non-parametric test if we have highly skewed data. So we might use uh, an, a non-parametric alternative to our t-test or our ANOVA. Or we could run our parametric tests twice, once with the outlier and a second time without the outlier, and then report both sets of findings. Or we could use a 95% trimmed mean when we report the descriptive statistics for this particular part of the data set. A second option to correct for outliers is 
If the score is not a legitimate score, it's a data entry error, we could simply correct that error. Change the 66 to a 6 because that is what the score should have been. If you can't quite tell what that score should have been, sometimes you can approximate. So if the score was a 45, it was either a 4 or a 5, you might approximate by using a 4.5, something between the two values that it could have been. A third option is to Windsorize. This is to take the outlier score and recode it as the next highest reasonable value that would match the rest of the data set. I did this with the outlier of 20. When I looked at the next lower score, which was at 8, and I changed that 20 score to a 9. It's still the highest score in the data set, but now the outlier is much closer to the rest of the data points. The last option for dealing with outliers is to throw out the outlier. However, I recommend doing this only as a last resort. If you can possibly find a way to keep this outlier in your data set and make it usable, I would encourage you to do that. So far, I've been talking about univariate outliers. Outliers that occur within a single variable. Now, these type of outliers can occur if we're measuring something like height or weight or income or prices, where we could naturally have an unusually high or unusually low score just through random selection. However, if you are using an item in a standardized test, particularly an anchored item, let's say using a Likert type scale, you cannot have an outlier within a single variable in that case. So for instance, if we're measuring job satisfaction and we use a single item that says, I feel that I am being paid a fair amount for the work that I do, which is anchored by six responses, there is no way that we can have an outlier unless it was a data entry error. The scores must range from one to six. Where univariate outliers become a problem is when you're combining multiple items into a scale. An individual who has a particularly high or low score on a scale can be a univariate outlier, but this requires multiple items. For example, I have a satisfaction with pay subscale, which includes that first item about being paid a fair amount, as well as an item about raises being too few and far between, feeling unappreciated because of what you're being paid, and feeling satisfied with your chances for salary increases. We would reverse score the second and third item, changing a one to a six and a six to a one, and then we would average those four items into a single satisfaction with pay subscale. For the aggregate of these four items, we could have someone who scores particularly high or particularly low on that scale. That could be a univariate outlier. A multivariate outlier would occur when we have multiple scales. So these are extreme scores that occur not on just one, but on multiple variables. And this requires the multiple subscale. We test for multivariate outliers using a Mahalanobis test. In this example, I've included multiple measures of job satisfaction, satisfaction with pay and promotion and supervision and so forth. Employee A has scores on all of these subscales. And as we look a little more closely, satisfaction with pay is a 3.2. Other lower scores are for fringe benefits and contingent rewards. However, satisfaction with supervision is a 5.8. Coworkers is a 6. Nature of the work is also a 5.8. So this is someone who loves their work, loves their coworkers and their boss, but feels underpaid. So this is more typical of what we would see with a job satisfaction scale. But now look at employee B. This person scores a one on every single subscale. This person is a multivariate outlier. What do we do with these types of outliers? Let me use an example of outliers in friendships. We all have friends who are a little idiosyncratic, a little odd in one way or another. If you have a friend who's odd in one particular way, that person would be a univariate outlier. 
A little bit crazy in just one little way can be endearing or charming. But if you have a friend who's crazy in a lot of ways, that person is a multivariate outlier. Just like in a friendship, a multivariate outlier can really mess with your data. And so when we have multivariate outliers in our data set, the only solution is to delete the multivariate outliers. What you do about your friend is up to you. But that is what we need to know about outliers. So next, we're going to return with the five number summary and box plots. And we're gonna do that in our next video.